what are your thoughts on online learning when it comes to learning uh, how to code? Uh, do your students need to be at your physical location? So the answer uh, to the second question, uh, do your students need to be at your physical location? That answer is yes. Uh, we're only in person. Um, we are you know, very adamant about uh, having in-person education. And the reason uh, why, why that is kind of answers the first question is that when you know, Neil and I started to learn how to code, all that was out there was either books or online uh, tutorials. So we went through pretty much every single resource you could. Uh, to try to learn how to code. Um, you know, we read all the books, we went through all the tutorials, we watched the screencasts, we read blog posts, we went through message boards. We literally tried to do everything that we could um, to learn. And a lot of those resources were helpful, but it was very difficult uh, as a beginner to try to figure out what was right and when was the right time to do it. You'd finish one resource and then you'd you know, say, well, what's next? And you go to Google. And so it was a lot of trial and error. And so Online is great. It's convenient. You can be wherever, just uh, you know, hooked up to the internet, and then you can learn you know, how to code. There's a, a lot of great uh, tutorials out there from Code Academy to Treehouse. Um, you know, even like Linda has been around for a while, lynda.com. So there's more resources than ever uh, you know, now to learn how to code. Uh, but what we found is that it's so much more effective for beginners, people without experience, to actually learn in person. Uh, to be surrounded by other people who are as passionate about learning as they are, to actually get instruction from a, from a teacher, someone who has development experience, has design experience, to ans ask questions instantly and get feedback instantly uh, in a, a classroom environment. So we kind of applied kind of an old style to learning a new technology, um, but it's not a traditional classroom. Uh, you know, there's, it's very interactive. Uh, we change our curriculum every week. Um, we're, we're highly iterative, so it's not you just get a syllabus and you learn um, the same topics over and over again. Um, we cater to what our, our students are learning, and you know, over the past two years, we've gotten pretty good at uh, teaching beginners you know, how to make web applications. So the next question is, oh, is all, all these questions are great. Um, why the change from Code Academy to the Starter League? Um, so this is a great question as well. Uh, we initially, spring of 2011, we kind of did the standard, traditional, um, how you find your name as a startup. We had a list of very bad um, URLs or domains that we had to choose from, um, whether it was Code Cloister or you know, Code Cat, all these really bad names. But then CodeAcademy.org just kind of stood out, and we decided um, that that was the name because at the time, we were only teaching one class. It was a web development course, uh, teaching Ruby on Rails. And it was a school, so Code Academy made sense. Um, and we also started off as a nonprofit, and we later switched to a for-profit, um, which is for another time, a very long and boring story. Um, so we were CodeAcademy.org starting in uh, April of 2011 until we launched um, August 2011. Um, and some of you might know, uh, there is another startup in New York uh, that's an online, free, interactive coding um, website called Code Academy minus the A, um, and so that instantly caused confusion. Um, we launched, you know, our second launch in August of 2011. And then three weeks later, they did their launch coming out of Y Combinator. And it was instant confusion on Twitter and Facebook and, you know, even in person. Um, people didn't know if they were the same thing, if we were the same company. Um, so that was one reason um, why we in initially changed. But the main reasons why we changed our name from Code Academy to the Starter League uh, was because we were expanding uh, as a school. Even though we are only teaching code um, primarily, we also begin, began to teach other things. So our second class was user experience design. Then we added HTML and CSS. And then we added visual design. And then we're also teaching entrepreneurship and bringing in entrepreneurs from Chicago and uh, different people like venture capitalists from Chicago to help people you know, get their ideas off the ground. Um, so we became much more than just Code Academy. Uh, and so that was kind of an issue kind of with just how we ran our school. Like we had some classes that didn't even touch code at all. And so Code Academy didn't really make sense as to where our company, our school was and where we wanted to go in the future. Um, so that's why we chose the Starter League. And really what that's about is two things. One is that Starter, the concept actually is from a book from one of our partners or two of our partners at 37 Signals, um, Jason Fried and David Hittemeyer Hansen. Um, they wrote a book called Rework. And in their book, they talk about the concept of a starter. 
And basically, it's another kind of word for entrepreneur. Um, you know, someone who wants to start something new, whether that's start a new job, uh, start working on an idea, start a company. So we really um, kind of gravitated to that word because we also were helping beginners learn how to get their start, whether that's designing, developing applications. Um, so we really like the starter concept. And then the league part was because over the past two years, we've taught, you know, over 700 people from all different backgrounds here in Chicago how to code and design. And they've become a big community. We have people who have co-founded uh, startups together. We have people who, li who live together. Um, and so this organic community kind of sprouted out of this class and this desire to you know, learn to be creators. And so that's kind of the full reason um, why we changed from Code Academy to the Starter League. The next question is, um, why did you format your school in a traditional quarter schedule? Uh, that's a great question as well. Um, so the reason why we did it, uh, part of uh, the reason is, you know, we both, Neil and I went to Northwestern and that's on a quarter schedule, three month uh, cycles. And so we thought that we could probably teach uh, someone how to code in three months. We didn't know. Um, we initially thought to do a nine month course, uh, bro broke it up into three quarters, uh, but we initially scaled that back. Um, so it's funny now, two years later, we actually have a new program called Starter School which is a nine month program that takes you from you know, nothing to an entrepreneur in nine months. Um, but our traditional classes that we've been doing over the past two years have been on a three month cycle. Um, and one, that's, uh, you know, we feel that's enough time to get you off the ground and get you started to build a, proto a prototype uh, in terms of a web app or a website. Um, and also it allows us to help as many people as possible who want to do the class. Um, so that's kind of why we've done the three month cycle is that we tested it we didn't know if it was going to work initially, but we found that in three months, we were able to take someone who was a beginner and help them you know, learn how to build a web application. Cool. So the next question, ah, this is, this is a good question here. Um, you were quoted by YEC as saying, entrepreneurs are, are people that solve problems instead of complaining about them. In what ways are you empowering people to create solutions? That is a great question. Um, so, I mean, the way that we're doing it, uh, you know, is by teaching. Um, you know, instead of focusing on building our own web application, we decided, you know, two and a half years ago that we would build a school to enable others to make their ideas real. Um, so that is the direct way that we are empowering people uh, to create their solutions uh, by teaching them, by giving them feedback, by testing their applications, uh, by connecting them with people who can help their our business grow. Um, so that is the direct way that we're helping out. Oh, this question is uh, about favorite apps. So what are your favorite apps as far as function and design goes? Ah, that's a tough question. Um, there are a lot of great apps out there. Uh, some of my favorites right now, uh, one is uh, Uber. I love the way Uber works. I think Uber, the mobile, the mobile app uh, has you know, redefined um, as far as mobile payments go and just uh, you know, convenience and efficiency. Uh, the app is amazing. The fact that I can, you know, right here, you know, uh, hail a cab, um, you know, or, you know, a fancy black car SUV. And within minutes, uh, it's picking me up and it takes me to my destination and I just get out of the car and don't have to worry about cash or credit card or tip. It's just all factored in right from my phone. I think that's, you know, uh, revolutionary. And I think it's, it's changed the way uh, that people think about mobile payments and just payments and just how do you craft a great user experience in general for your application. Um, so that's a, a big favorite of mine. Obviously, uh, you know, one of my favorite apps that I use a lot is Basecamp, which is a you know, project management software by 37signals. Um, as, as a company at the Starter League, we use it religiously uh, for managing our projects to managing communication. Um, so that's something uh, that is extremely uh, helpful for me. Um, so those are two, two apps that are current favorites. I have tons. Uh, even have a big list of them, uh, but of course I'm blanking out on the other ones right now. But Uber and Basecamp are two apps that I use a lot, uh, and really have changed the way that I work and you know how I you know navigate through the city. So this next question is kind of related for 37 Signals. And um, the question is, uh, what's the